Hello, good evening, evening ma'am. Good evening, good evening. Welcome good evening. back, ma'am. And thank you for yeah. taking out your time for this session. Uh, ma'am, Dr. Kakkar is here. I think so. I have just asked sir on the phone to join. So I was just seeing if our voices are clear and if everything is going well. Just checking. Right, right. Okay. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Guru ma'am. Good evening, Ranga sir. Good evening, everybody who's joined. We are just waiting for Kakati to join. Good evening, Kakar sir. Thanks for Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, please unmute yourself. Uh, Kakar sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. You're audible. I can see Dr. Pasi also. Yes, yes. He's also joined. 
So please unmute yourself. Dr. Piasi, the pass is on a mute mode. Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you now. Seeing you after a long time. <laughs> Good evening. I I I ditched you last time. I, I know, I know. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay, okay. Sure, sure. So you're in the car, you are driving back. Yes, yes. I I have still not reached home. Oh, good, good. Okay, sir. So uh, I'm waiting for Dr. Satijan, sir, to join. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether can you, he... do Dr. Raman, can you introduce us to those yeah, who have already joined? Sure, sure, sir. I'm just waiting for Dr. Satijan, sir, to join. Uh, mean, meanwhile, I'm... you you talk. Yes. Tell us who uh, okay. others have joined already. Okay, okay. So, sir, uh, I can see Dr. Vikas Karsar is there and Dr. Ashima, she has joined. The moderator okay. for today's session. Yes. And uh, hello, Ashima. Hello, Ashima. Hello, Ashima. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Ashima. Nice to see you. Are you are very committed to the purpose, sir. You are in your car, you're traveling, and still you're logged in. Uh -huh, of course. Why not? When Ashima is there, I will always lock in. Lock in. So, Ashima, uh, what is the news from Dr. Satish Jain? The sir will be joining us shortly. All right, all right. So, Dr. Raman can uh, brief us. Uh, let Dr. Vikas Kakar start the proceedings. Uh, uh, he can just uh, brief us about what is what all is going to happen. So, uh, I'll just say one thing. Uh, is, uh, as we all know, the adequate knowledge of the surgical anatomy forms the basis of good mastered surgery. And we also know this thing, the temporal bone is one of the most complicated areas in the human body. And so is the radiology. It has never been my favorite topic. And uh, I have found it always difficult how to read the CD scan to be very honest with you. So I, I think uh, it's a very good thing that uh, has started with the efforts of our president and secretary and Dr. Raman Sharma has taken the lead. And Dr. Ashima is also equally involved in that. So with the efforts of these two persons, I, I think they are doing a commendable job. I must congratulate them for this wonderful series of and we cannot think of a vision on the radiology of the temporal bone. And shortly he'll be joining us and rest. Uh, I think he will explain everything about it. Right, sir. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all in this fourth session of uh, our academic module, which we are running under the aegis of Rihanna AOI. So I'm Dr. Raman Sharma. And I think Dr. Steesh Jain yes, is yes. He's joining. He's joining. Yes, sir. He's joining. Uh, he, so just ask him to unmute. Yes, yes. I request all to please unmute yourself. Uh, mute yourself to avoid any disturbance during the session. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, Dr. Satijan, sir. We welcome you. Sir, you're not audible. Satijan, sir. Hello, Satish, sir. Hi. 
Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So, sir, I was telling about this session that uh, this is our fourth session uh, of our academic module, which we are running under the aegis of Haryana AI. And uh, I'm Dr. Daman Sharma. I'm assistant professor at Molana Zad Medical College and chief coordinator of this program. Uh, I would like to thank all my participants, all the candidates for their consistent support and participation in this academic activity. And I, uh, I also thank all these senior faculties for taking out the time to make it uh, a successful academic event. So everyone uh, knows that today is uh, the session on radiology, which will be taken by uh, Dr. Satish Jain, sir, the radiology of the temporal bone. So with this, I would like to introduce uh, the moderator for today's session, uh, Dr. Vikas Kakkar, sir. Sir is head of the department at SGT Medical College, Gurgaon. And uh, I would like also to introduce our second moderator for today's session, Dr. Rashima Saxena. Madam is a consultant at Sri Ashwani Saxena Hospital uh, at Rivadi. So I request my moderators to please introduce uh, the guest faculty for today's session, uh, Dr. Satish Jain, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Satish. Can you hear me? I think sir is having some difficulty with the mic. Uh, so please adjust it. I, I think let him join. Yes, yes. I think uh, meanwhile, <coughs> moderator <coughs> can keep us busy if somehow some some anecdote or something something regarding radiology of course not uh, any anything else <coughs> uh, how many pg students are there is there any number raman can you uh, total yeah, 65 people we... locked in right now sir uh, total 65 yeah participants are there wow that's a, a big number we expect more because last time we had about 90 or okay 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 so I think people will be shortly joining yeah so i, I think this time uh, we will outnumber the previous uh, lecture yeah so dr swinder there is also a youtube not... link so that if there are more participants than 100 then they will uh, shift to the youtube link for which is getting live streamed at the moment Good evening, sir. Good evening to all. Good evening. Good evening. Sir, Dr. Singhal is busy in convocation today. He will not yes, uh, join today. Sir. Okay, okay. We'll be missing our president. Yes, sir. Our, uh, this, for, until that time, I, I must congratulate you for your wedding anniversary. Oh. Uh, you, do you know? Sir, uh, he has you. celebrated his 25th Silver Jubilee wedding anniversary. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So it, it was yesterday or day before yesterday? Sir, it was on the 8th. 8th? Yes, sir. Only three days back. Yes, sir. Uh, Rupinder, so, what is the secret? How did you manage 25 years together? Sir. <laughs> he has not managed. She has managed. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> it, it's one of the same thing. Dr. He is Dr. in Dr. Sir was, Dr. Sir was manage, manage everything, sir. Okay. We are just uh, do this ENT, OPD, and OT. Nothing more than that, sir. <laughs> so that's how how that's how yes, it has been managed. ENT is my passion, ah. and uh, I'm spending good life with Dr. Saroj and with children, sir. Yeah, that's that's uh, great. Abhi uh, Ruplo, iska to me Dr. Rupender ka dance nahi dekha. दिखाते नहीं है यार हम ही डांस करते रह जाते हैं जगह जगह हाँ हम ही डांस करते हैं आगे आगे कर देते हैं डांस कराते हैं ये कहते हैं कि भाई ईएनटी सर्जन से ज़्यादा तो ये डेस्टेश हो गया चलो यू आर बीजी फेलो आई एम कॉलिंग यू अगेन एंड अगेन इनवाइटिंग यू अगेन एंड अगेन टू बिवानी बट अनफॉर्च Rupinder put me on duty for that. Ah, yeah. Okay, sir. 
मेरे को दोनों तरफ कैरी करना पड़ेगा पहली बार तो होश में फिर बेहोश में वी विल टेक केयर ऑफ टू कंडीशन सर हाँ ठीक है कोई नहीं हेलो What about uh, Dr. Satish Jain? Has he joined back or he is he joined? Here? Probably he is joined, but there is uh, some issue with the audio. Audio, so he is uh, managing that. Okay. So we so can see him. Like, yes, yes, we can see him. I would like to uh, tell all our PG students who have joined this session that uh, this radiology of the temporal bone is very, very important uh, for your MS exam. Every one of you is uh, going to get. The radio uh, HRCT temporal bone and uh, <coughs> different different kind of questions. So I would like to uh, ask uh, our senior faculties, our senior examiners over here. Hello. So what, what is? Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, Dr. Dr. Satish has come back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Vikas, Vikas, take over. Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible, Satish. Yeah. Am I audible, yes, sir? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, yes. yes you are audible. Audible now. Much for your patience. Hi, Satish. Hello, sir. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. Hello. Very good evening. First oh, of all, we goodness. must thank you for sparing the valuable time and sh sharing your knowledge and expertise with all of us. All thanks to you all, all Haryana AY people, the association and the big guns. I can see Vikas Kakkar sir, Pasi sir, Tupendra Ranga sir, and. so many all star words and thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to share with you all it's always a pleasure to listen to you and see to your you operating and uh, i have been you, asked sir. to introduce you and uh, you do not need an introduction everybody over here needs to everything your about students, you your but students is the biggest introduction uh i i would like to share couple of things with the, all the participants one thing he is having an auditorium in his hospital and he has named that auditorium by the name of dr abr desai that is the respect and regard students gives to his teachers as secondly i don't know whether you remember or not few years back uh, uh, one thing whenever i am in jaipur i always go to ent uh, jain ent hospital so a few years back i was there and he had good couple of surgeries and i watched all those surgeries then he started with opd and he finished at opd around 11 11:30 and then he asked me let's sir ghar chalte hain ji i went to his house had a couple of drinks at 12 o'clock at night gora medicry was there whether it you remember or not yes sir yes sir and yes, he yes, called sir. gorav let us do some academics maine 12 baje keh diya boss mere ko khana khilao aur main sona chahta hu and he started the academics right at 12 o'clock at night i don't know at what time they finished and next day morning 8 o'clock he was there in the hospital again and he took his shower also in the hospital so much dedicated and committed he is to this profession one more thing i would like to share about him he has the, got the huge library in his house so i have never ever seen such a big library in any individual's house rest teach will tell us about this library also how many books does he have and how many journals he has but that was something to watch so the moral of the story we cast here is that academics is always better after a few drinks the, 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 the alcohol always works <laughs> <laughs> so anyway sir i think we will start now because uh, yes, being sir. a long session so we want to finish in time yes sir and uh, dr satish jain i am dr bhargav here and uh, yes, welcome sir. to welcome to you and uh, let's start off let's thank start thank you off. Thank you once again, and I can see Pasi sir also on the screen. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yes, yes. Good evening. Good evening. Please good carry evening, on. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So, uh, as the topic today for the discussion is radiology of the temporal bone. We all know temporal bone radiology is very important. Many a times, like we discussed last time, for the CT scan. 
nowadays the dimension of you know looking at radiology is totally changed changed for the region for trying to get more and more information for our surgical point of view uh, are you getting something on the screen sir yes, yes sir we can see it is can we can see we can are see you... mri sir mri see? MRI or CT scan? MRI, we can see. Oh, let me share the CT. Uh, now, now, yes, do you see the now CT scan? It is, yes, sir. So first, for the I know there are a lot many junior colleagues, uh, you know, uh, uh, with us in this seminar. CT scan temporal bone is a very, very useful information, gives useful information regarding three-dimensional anatomy of this, one of the most complex bone of this body. This is not only single bone, but there are a lot many ossicles suspended in this bone. And so many important structures traversing from bone to the extracranial structures, carotid artery, facial nerve, jugular bulb, so many other things with some millimetric distances from the critical areas from our disease and everything. So here, a some millimetric anatomy can change the entire scenario. And that's what the utility of the radiology to give us that information pre-op. So CT temporal bone is very, very useful in diagnosis. Not many of times for the diagnosis. But yes, it helps in, in difficult situations, but more often to give us surgical information in terms of giving three-dimensional anatomical information and in differential diagnosis. This is very, very important in preventing complication. So first of all, what kind of a CT scan we should order in our practice to get maximum information on how to look at it in different situations. So the best, like I said in the PNS talk, we should have DICOM files. We should order 0.5 mm, 0.6, whatever available to your radiologist, but minimum 0.5 mm CT scans in axial plane and rest your software will reconstruct so that you can get three-dimensional information. Rather than getting into printout, which do not give dynamic information, this DICOM files give you three-dimensional information. Like PNS, there are certain structures which are best seen on axial sections, certain on sagittal, certain on coronal. Similarly, here in temporal bone as well, the onus on the surgeon is to look for those things which are best seen in particular sections, which I'm going to discuss with you. So how to look at CT scan, that is second most important thing. See, when you get a CT scan for a, suppose, autosclerosis, where you actually need a CT scan to see any anatomical abnormality, not for diagnosis of autosclerosis, the radiologist will report in one line, normal study of CT temporal bone. Radiologists are too busy reporting their, you know, brain CT and other uh, abdomen and other CT rather than giving time on a temporal bone and PSS, which is Fine, fine, some millimetric details need to be addressed. We have given earlier a couple of times to various radiologists or proforma to give us complete information. That proforma carries more than 300 points which radiologists cannot, you know, afford to give that much of time. And they straightforward refuse. So ultimately, my point is the onus is on the surgeon to look at CT scan in different perspective in different diseases. That's what I'm come. Uh, I'm uh, putting forward in temporal bone without wasting time. So first of all, how to look at the CT scan? See, on the left corner, this is 0.7 mm scan. By every move, my slice is going to be run by 0.7 mm. Every time it is going to skip 0.7 mm. In temporal bone, when we order the CT scan, according to the pathology, accordingly, we need to look at the structures. For example, if I am suspecting autosclerosis, I need to look at the CT scan from autosclerosis perspective. What are the things which can change my diagnosis from autosclerosis? 
what difficulties i can encounter in autosclerosis surgery those i need to look at like any prolapsing facial nerve any incus fixation malleus fixation anterior atrial fixation uh, any possibility of uh, uh, persistent stapedial artery all those things which can complicate your course of autosclerosis surgery you need to look at those situations in cochlear implantation we need to look at different perspective in csom surgery in cholecystoma surgery we need to look at different perspective so it is important why you are looking at ct scan so let me tell you one by one this is axial sections i will keep pointing out what situations or what anatomy is best seen in coronal what anatomy is best seen in sagittal and why it is important for example imagine i am looking for the autosclerosis number 1 see this is coming from top to bottom this is axial section this is anterior this is posterior i am coming down now see this is tilted picture this is the petrous body which is coming and the petrous cells now see on this side the first see this this the first important structure coming from about the top most structure in the temporal bone is superior semicircular canal and if i go down see this is the anterior limb this is ampullary and this is non ampullary end of the superior canal this is a very very important structure as we have seen in our practice couple of cases of superior canal dehiscence syndrome presenting as conductive hearing loss normal tympanic bone everything normal and when the exploration for the autosclerosis exploration for the stapy surgery done the ossicular chain was found mobile normal middle ear finding and ultimately we had to close it back and when we went to ct scan it was actually a superior canal dehiscence which can present with a conductive hearing loss in the lower frequencies ct scan can easily rule out but see even if there is dehiscence in the axial sections you cannot make out see you need to see upside down picture now see what i am doing i am converting to coronal the same uh, ct scan i am converting to coronal and then i will show you see this let me show you see this is vestibule and these are all the three canals can you see this is vestibule this is the lateral canal going laterally covered by the thick bone this is superior canal going up and this is posterior canal going behind now see if i follow dynamically look at the bone over the superior canal i am following the entire course following the entire course of the superior canal see there we should carefully see if some bone is dehiscent over it see this is the way to look at the superior canal dehiscent you can see on the opposite side as well see this where my cursor is there is a thick bone over the superior canal can you see very clear that rules out a possibility of a superior canal dehiscent which one can easily overlook and if there is a superior canal dehiscence associated with autosclerosis superior canal dehiscence is what is the third window in the intact labyrinth labyrinth has normally two windows the sound coming preferentially through the ossicular chain to the whole window whole window goes in and because of the movement in the fluid and the baffle wax round window comes out and there is no other leakage of sound sound energy anywhere in the vestibule now if there is a superior canal dehiscence what happens there is leakage of sound so count sound coming to the whole window is not able to you know mobilize the inner ear fluid because it is leaking somewhere so there is inner ear conductive hearing loss now if it is a big one it can give symptoms vestibular symptom auditory symptoms i am not going in detail but if there is associated autosclerosis what can happen this the stepage is not mobile there are only two windows working stepage is fixed so only the round window and the canal dehiscence is working and moment you do the step dot means such cases the third window become functional the patient who was not symptomatic now become symptomatic 
the moment you open the your uh, oval window the third window starts functioning and the patient who was asymptomatic becomes symptomatic so you have to be very careful in diagnosis of superior canal dysfunction it is very important that's why in otosclerosis generally ct scan is not mandatory but this is one surgery when the patient comes with a conductive hearing loss and if you are not careful if you are not aware of the anatomical abnormalities like this patient can develop sensory neural hearing loss which is something not you know nobody wants even the patient or a doctor this is one of the most rewarding surgery so it is always better to have a ct scan to rule out all such possibilities number 1 now as i am going down see this is see this going up this is the non ampullary end i am following the non ampullary end non ampullary end non ampullary end and this non ampullary end continues as the ampullary end of the posterior canal because non ampullary end of the posterior and superior joint together so this is posterior canal now coming back up this is the ampullary end so these are two ends of the superior canal we must see now coming down now see the most important thing coming is the intraartery meatus can you see this intraartery meatus Yeah. this dimension of the intraartery meatus is very important for many surgeries many surgeries means if you are doing otosclerosis if you are doing cochlear implantation both you need to see any change in dimension of the intraartery meatus if intraartery meatus is too big see with this um, uh, you know with this software i can measure the distances in some millimetric accuracy see this i can measure the dimension of the intraartery meatus at various level if it is too big can be a problem too big means there could be direct communication between the intraartery meatus and the inner ear and that is the sole source of csf gusher earlier it was assumed that the cochlear aqueduct could be one of the source of csf gusher not a single case so far has been reported where the cochlear aqueduct has been attributed as a cause of cs of gusher it is the direct communication of the subarachnoid spaces containing csf from the intraartery meatus to the inner ear space and see what is there blocking this this is cochlear aperture can you see this cochlear aperture this is important where this is the modulus and all these things blocking the communication direct flow of csf to the inner ear and this is important to see both in otosclerosis surgery as well as cochlear implantation surgery because it can lead to gusher otherwise many a times if you are not aware if you don't have a ct scan you are doing a stapes surgery and can lead to gusher if the intraartery meatus is too dilated what happens many time we have seen where we didn't get the ct scan done and we uh, came across the gusher there was conductive hearing loss on audiogram sort of mixed type of a hearing loss with conductive component because of this direct communication of the inner ear the csf fluid with the inner ear fluid giving a situation of inner ear hypertension more inner ear pressure with the foot plate mobility is reduced giving false conductive hearing loss the moment you open the inner ear and there is a gusher and those are the patient which eventually develop sensory neural hearing loss those are not the candidate for stapes surgery anyway so the ct scan can prevent you from a major problem if you are very aware so what do you need to look at intraartery meatus dimensions this is very important in stapes surgery as well as cochlear implant surgery both then the cochlea and vestibule see this this intraartery meatus leads to various nerves to the cochlea vestibule and inner ear so if i see superiorly the antero superior nerve which is leading in the facial nerve can you see very clear the facial nerve leading from the antero superior part of the intraartery canal if i follow this this is the first genu first genu if i follow this this is the horizontal segment if i follow further that is the second genu this is the mastoid course follow my cursor most mastoid course mastoid course this is mastoid course and then ultimately it comes out from the stylomastoid foramen
Now, if I'm coming back, see now, coming back, just about the stylomastered foramen. See this, just about the stylomastered foramen, a small nerve emerged from the facial nerve. See carefully. Follow my cursor. I am following this small nerve. Small nerve. Small nerve. Going to the, see this, going to the medial edge of the, medial end of the external of the meatus. This is called a tympani. And this space between corda and the facial is the facial recess. This is very, very important to know from the cochlear implantation point of view, not from stapes and other point of view, because this gives a, one of the most important access to the posterior part of the middle ear through the mastoid, known as posterior tympanotomy. And in every case, if you look like this, you can measure the dimension of the facial recess. See, this is almost three millimeter. And this is very important and information in the cochlear implant surgery, whether your dimension of the facial recess is adequate. Though it is not uh, very much malformed in any given situation, the reason being at the time of birth, the dimension of the middle ear, inner ear, and the facial recess are same as of adult. Newborn has the same dimension of the facial recess as the adult, it doesn't change. Middle ear doesn't change, inner ear doesn't change. What all changes is the mastoid and the external artery canal dimension, not the facial recess, middle ear and inner ear. So this facial recess, you can pick up from the CT scan, from this dynamic CT scan. You cannot pick up in the CT scan plates. You know, when we talk of CT scan, it should be dynamic only to give us most adequate information what you can think of. So this is facial now. We have seen this horizontal, all the portions of the facial now. This is very important from various surgical point of view. In, in, in uh, you know, this is the first genu. In stapes surgery, this is important whether your horizontal segment is prolapsing down over the oval window. If you are not aware of this information preoperatively in autosclerosis surgery, you can see this as a surprise when you explore the middle ear. And how can you see best? This is the axial section. If the nerve is prolapsing from above down, you need to have this information in the coronal section. See now, so important you yourself can see. See this. See this is ossicular chain. Let me show you ossicular chain in the coronal section. See this. Malleus. This is incus. And this is step is going to the oval window. This is oval window. This is vestibule. All the three canals. Now see, this is ossicular chain. Malleus, incus, and the stapes. Stapes crush. Can you see very clear? Going to the oval window and see here is your facial now above that. Above the level of the oval window. In any given situation, if your facial now is prolapsing, you will see this facial now prolapsing down over the whole window. And if you see this kind of a situation pre-op, it all depends upon your experience, how you counsel your patient. Majority of the time, what we have practiced in a, in a setting, you know, yeah, obviously you have to be extra careful, otherwise it may result in facial paralysis, palsy, paralysis, whatever in handling the facial now. So you have to be very careful in counseling your patient that this kind of a situation will require some sort of manipulation of the facial now, which can result in weakness. And in if we are not able to give you get adequate space and put a piston, we may have to abandon. If you don't have this information, you will see intraoperatively as a surprise, and then you have no option but to abandon because you can't counsel your patient adequately at that time. So this is so important to see. See, this is facial now. See, this is facial now that where the oval window, this is the stapedial crust, and this is facial now above the level of the oval window. This is the oval window above the level of the oval window. So this is very, very, you know, useful, vital information as far as the facial nerve is concerned. So facial nerve, the entire course, we must look in various pathologies. This is horizontal segment. This is not uncommon to see the horizontal segment dehiscences. In cholesteatomas, 
many a time patient comes with a facial palsy with a good ct scan you can get to know where the cholesterolomy is actually involving the facial now and accordingly you can plan your you know reconstruction or whatever you intend to do on the facial now but that information is very very vital so the first nerve what you see is the facial now and the other side is the superior vestibular now this is vestibule this is cochlea you know and this is the third now this is cochlear now this is inferior vestibular now going to the ki this is posterior semicircular canal and this is one of the singular nerve what we call it singular nerve going to the posterior canal on a good fine ct scan you can pick up so well singular nerve this is singular now this is inferior vestibular now this is cochlear aperture leading to the cochlear now this cochlear aperture is a significance in various surgeries to know number one in cochlear implantation if this cochlear aperture is too widened there is high possibility of a gusher there is high possibility of a you know direct communication of the csf space with the inner ear space if this cochlear aperture is very narrow there is a high possibility of being a you know uh, thin cochlear now and that you have to give a guarded prognosis to those patients if you have a thin cochlear now that may not be adequate to transmit the sound though still it is not a you know a direct contraindication absolute contraindication but yes this is something you need to counsel your patient well now the third important information as you go down from here is the anatomy of the cochlear and vestibule malformation in the inner ear are not uncommon in cochlear implantation this is very very important as in embryogenesis the cochlea starts as an autocyst and then matures wherever at what point of time during that uh, you know in a, during embryogenesis at, at any point of time if the developmental arrest happens that kind of a cochlear anomaly ultimately patient has if you know this cochlear development starts at the third week of gestation and it continues till 25th week and majority of the development of the cochlear you know morphology happens to occur from 3rd to 9th week suppose there is a developmental arrest at the 3rd week there will be no cochlear no vestibule suppose there is a development at the 4th week then this autocyst enlarges to become a common cavity and at that time if the development arrest occurs the patient will have a finally a common cavity then it differentiates into cochlear and vestibule in the 5th week if developmental arrest happens there could be separate cochlear and vestibule with no internal architecture so there are variety of cochlear malformation which develop and accordingly you can see on the ct scan and accordingly your strategy of the cochlear implantation you know changes massively there are anomalies like ip1 ip3 common cavity which has a high possibility of a ch of gusher and you need to plan your surgical technique accordingly in those patients like we do a subtotal petrojectinal implantation with a complete obliteration of the cavity to prevent any future possibility of a you know gusher so you have to be prepared according to the anomaly of the cochlea in autosclerosis you need to look at the cochlea differently because cochlea can be involved in autosclerotic process only if the cochlea is involved in autosclerotic process then you have to identify that situation cochlear autosclerosis and accordingly plan your surgery and the post operative medical treatment because those are the difficult patient in terms of you know uh, giving good outcome those are the patient who require long term medical therapy to prevent this process of osteogenesis and osteolysis and third is you need to take a call finally when there is profound sense in neural hearing loss even your stepodotomy in hearing aid doesn't work I and mean, there are massive changes in the cochlea to do a cochlear implantation even in the massive autosclerotic patient we have done couple of patients cochlear implantation and doing well so you have to identify those changes in the cochlea see for example i'll show you see the normal bone normal petrous bone around the cochlea the dense bone now if the patient if the patient suppose has a cochlear autosclerosis how will it look like how it look like let me show you how does the cochlear autosclerosis look like okay. 
say this. Say this particular patient has a massive cochlear otosclerosis. And we recently did a cochlear implantation in this patient. See this. You saw in the previous cochlea, the, the dense bone around the cochlea. Now see the entire bone around the cochlea is hollowing out. There are multiple halos around the cochlea. That signifies the cochlear autosclerosis. And you can imagine how difficult is going to be the cochlear implantation in this scenario. See this? This is the basal tan, and this is completely, you know, involved by the autosclerotic pukai. Once you open the round window, open the area surrounding the round window, you will find the whitish bone. You have to clear that bone to enter into the cochlea like this. So that those are difficult patients. Sometimes the autosclerotic process involves the entire cochlea, and you may have to do a massive drill out, sometimes complete drill out. So all depends upon the CT scan position. But it starts at the basal turn and then spreads everywhere. And this particular case had the involvement of the basal turn by this autosclerotic process, which we could clear up, drill out, and then rest of the cochlear lumen was good. See, rest of the cochlear lumen was good. Only the basal turn uh, beginning was involved, which we could clear off. So this is how you need to look at the cochlear at autosclerosis because sometimes uh, this is uh, one of the major problems you come across. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, it? Oh. yes. So, coming back to the same scan, you can see the cochlea. Sometimes the vestibule is dilated. You have to be careful, as one of the syndrome is an enlarged vestibular aqueduct syndrome. Enlarged vestibule, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, all those things to be carefully, you know, addressed. See, this is the vestibular aqueduct at the posterior edge of the vestibule, at the posterior edge of the petrous bone is a thin canal. The inside of the vestibular aqueduct is like a thin hair you can pass through. And see, this opens in the vestibule here. So this vestibular aqueduct, dimension of the vestibule, all are important while doing stapes surgery or cochlear implantation as if you are not aware of this can lead to gusher and you have to be prepared to deal with that. So all this anatomy is important. Then comes to the ossicular chain. This is very important, not only in stapes surgery, not only uh, in CSOM surgery. Many a times you may have ossicles eroded. And this kind of information you can very get very well from the CT scan. See this. This is anterior posterior information. This is your head of the malleus. This is your incus. You know, many a times we have seen in patients with conductive hearing loss explored for the autosclerosis had incus fixation to the wall, bony fixation of the incus, bony fixation of the malleus anteriorly. And this is very important. You can see the entire ossicular chain. See this entire malleus, incus, and see this is the stapedial arch. This is the stapedial arch, and this is the included stapedial joint. This is the, in a good CT scan, you can have complete information of the entire ossicular chain when you are suspecting ossicular disruption or any other abnormal fixation of the ossicle. Last year, only we did two cases of the way where the malleus was fixed in the attic. You know, completely fixing the ossicular chain, pure conductive hearing loss. And how to pick up that? In the coronal section. See in the coronal. See in the coronal, upside down. This is malleus. And this is suspended with the superior malleolar ligament. If they get ossified, there is a bony lamella, which is, you know, attaching the malleus to the you know, uh, roof of the attic and leads to fixation of the ossicular chain. And you can very well see, very well see if the malleus is fixed in the attic. So, ossicular chain, their integrity, abnormal fixation, all those things you can pick up very well on a good CT scan. Only thing you need to know what is to be seen in what section, what all things to be emphasized and seen in particular disease pathologies 
this is very important so coming to the same uh, point we are going from upside down now as we go down now we have seen vestibular aqueduct vestibule cochlea facial nerve ossicular chain now as we further go down this is very important see the cochlea see all the three turns of the cochlea apical middle and the basal turn this is important in cochlear implant surgeries and see this is this is this is round window this is round window this is round window which is you know closing the cochlea from behind this is the window this is the membrane closing the cochlea from behind and this is the membrane which is the site of you know interest in cochlear implant surgery when you you know open the cochlea for the insertion of the implant and this is very important to to be seen in all planes how the round window is placed whether it is favorable or not there are so many things sometimes you do a posterior tympanotomy and you don't see the cochlear round window if you don't see the round window you cannot insert the implant if you try to you may get disoriented now this kind of information whether it is feasible or not whether it is favorable or not is very well seen on ct scan now see at this point this is round window and a very faint very faint this is this is cochlear aqueduct opening very close to the round window this is cochlear aqueduct cochlear aqueduct as a theoretical value this is never going to give gusher but this is responsible for spread of infection from the subarachnoid space to the cochlea like in pneumococcal meningitis when the cochlea gets ossified this is the this is the conduit for the infection to spread from the subarachnoid space from the round from the cochlear aqueduct and this ossification starts first in the basal turn close to the round window and then spreads to the entire basal turn then middle turn and apical turn like that now in such patient at what point of time you pick up diagnose those patient develop profound hearing loss and accordingly your surgical technique is in, you know directed if only basal turn is involved you can drill out the entire basal turn and if other turns are involved then you have to do a you know complete drill out and multiple electrodes need to be inserted to give maximum amplification so this is round window now how to see whether this round window is favorable or not uh, i had a discussion some day uh, with pasi sir regarding this whether a particular patient's round window is feasible to be seen through the posterior tympanotomy or not i'll give you a simple way i'll i'll show you the simplest way how you can see see this on the opposite side this is round window this is basal turn this is round window this is basal turn yes now let me show you certain anatomy this is facial now see where my cursor is this is facial now this is your facial now mastoid portion of the facial now see where my cursor is this is your cauda tympani at the medial edge of the round uh, exonotary canal if i draw if i draw at this point of time see this i take two lines simple one line along the cauda tympani anteriorly one parallel line along the anterior edge of the facial nerve lateral to the facial this is facial now lateral to this this is cauda tympani lateral to that medial to that and if i see through that coming from here drilling this bone this bone is the facial recess in between these two and if i come like this and see straight what is that round window in the basal turn of the cochlea how favorable it is you come from laterally drilling the mastoid and then drilling the posterior tympanotomy between the cauda tympani and the facial now and once you open up this space seeing from laterally you will straight away it leads to round window and the basal turn of the cochlea how favorable it is you know what happens sometimes 
the cochlea rotates. That is a developmental anomaly. The cochlea rotates. If the cochlea or the round window is rotated behind, suppose it is rotated behind, you will not be able to see, see through this posterior tympanotomy directly. You open up a posterior tympanotomy, if the cochlea is medially rotated, you may not see the, posterior, the cochlea through that, the round window through that. And those are the difficult patients wherein your experience you know, matters. You need to do a, a, some sort of canal mobilization or you may have to do a subtotal petrojectomy to recover, rediscover the anatomy and then open up the round window and do the rest of the job. But the feasibility whether the round window is feasible or favorable to the posterior tympanotomy can be seen very well to the CT scan. And this dynamic CT scan has an immense value in terms of, you know, finding accessibility of the round window uh, in cochlear implantation. This is a very, very useful information. See on the other side, this is called a tympani, this is facial now. Two lines, one line, sorry, one line along the facial now here, lateral to the facial now, and one line parallel to the, this, See this quarter tympani and what is falling in between if I'm coming from there? The basal turn of the cochlea. See how feasible it is the exposure of the long axis of the basal turn. You can put a straight forward implant into it to the round window if this kind of a favorable situation is there. So this is very important. Now once you see the cochlea, you need to look at anteriorly. Anteriorly, this is your carotid artery. You have to see this distance between the cochlear lumen and the carotid artery sometimes could be dissected. See this bone over the carotid artery, even in the CSM surgery, sometimes the carotid may be prominent, bone may be dissected. In, in cochlear implant surgery, there are reports where the carotid canal was dissected, the bone between the cochlear and carotid was deficient, and the implant finally inserted into the carotid canal. That's a disaster. So the, you need to look at this partition whether the cock webinar, whether the carotid artery is decent or not. So this is very, very important to you know the information about the carotid artery. And then as you go down, this is sub, you know, see this is cochlea. I am going down and the cochlea disappears and this is hypotympanum. Now to know the details of the hypotympanum, you need to go to the coronal section. See, once you are Looking at the cochlear implant perspective, middle ear surgery perspective, CSOM surgery, stapes at the level of this round window. See, there is no jugular bulb over here. No jugular bulb over here. That means the jugular bulb is not that high. If you see in the axial section at this point where you see the round window, if you see the jugular bulb in the same picture, means jugular bulb is so high to have come to the level of the round window. This is very, very important. I will give you examples of what I said, just to understand that how important it is because sometimes you, you never know and you come across surprises if you don't have a CT scan. If you don't have a CT scan, you come across some surprises. Uh, let me show you. Uh, Uh, probably this is the patient. Yes. See this particular patient. This is the example of a high jugular bulb. Classic example. See at the level of the round window. See how high the jugular bulb is. You never see the jugular bulb at this level. At the round window. In the axial section. And if you are trying to open the round window at this level. See on the opposite side. If you are trying to open the round window one can injure the jugular bulb, which is immediately below. You have to be very careful. The bone that plays, as more the jugular bulb is high, more the bone surrounding the jugular bulb will be thinner. And injury to the jugular bulb is a major complication. And in a cochlear implant surgery, particularly when you're operating on a child, see, this child uh, scan you are seeing was nine months old when I operated this patient. Nine months old, and see, this was a high jugular bulb. We took up for the, you know, 
cochlear implantation we had this information and we could do it because we were knowing this fact that how high jugular bulb you have to deal with many a time we have seen jugular bulb even higher than this going above the round window level even to the oval window or above the oval window level and those situation you have to decompress the jugular bulb slowly slowly by a very slow bipolar surgery cell bone wax you can compress it down down by means of surgery cell and bone wax you can fix it down and you can get acquire more space and then you can do your job whatever you want to so this high jugular ball is a is a one of the uh, very important finding we should know at this point of time now in in um, you know csom surgery there are many other important things uh, to be seen uh, let me come back to the same uh, yes in csom surgery you need to look at a ct scan from different perspective what um, uh, i have quickly gone through the different perspective of otosclerosis and csom uh, uh, cochlear implant surgery now in csom you need more information about the editors more information about the eustachian tube see this see this this is carotid artery this is eustachian tube laterally if you have disease going to the eustachian tube this is eustachian tube this is your tympanic membrane your information about the editors this is editors information about the ossicular chain information about the dome of the lateral canal see this is lateral canal if there is a lateral canal fistula you can appreciate with this kind of dices of this bone if there is a labyrinthine fistula or lateral canal fistula then the pneumatization of the mastoid whether it is adequate or not how you can simply got this pneumatization see this is the prominence of the jugular bulb uh, sigmoid sinus behind this is sigmoid sinus behind this is the second genu of the facial nerve measure the distance between the jugular bulb and the second genu of the facial now will give you uh, you know adequate idea about the size of the mastoid this is see the second genu of the facial now and this is the see this 1.5 cm quite adequate from the sigmoid sinus to the facial now so you can have a fairly good idea whether you have a contracted mastoid whether you have a highly pneumatized mastoid because those are very important in decision making once you plan cholestatoma surgery you are biased toward giving a canal down mastoidectomy if you have a narrow contracted mastoid because you are not likely to give a big cavity you can avoid cavity problems if you have a very very highly pneumatized mastoid then you are biased towards giving a interiorization or intact canal surgery because if you try to excentrate all cells which is very very difficult number one and ultimately is going to give you a huge huge cavity to manage and you know cavity problems are so prevalent so important and so frustrating to the patient so that kind of information you can easily get uh, from this now i'll give you some more examples of the abnormalities what we have uh, uh, seen see this ct scan is very important in revision mastoid surgeries revision surgeries are very important surgeries and then ct scans are very important in those situation uh in those close what happened yeah uh so yeah Hmm? Yeah. yeah now this was from the ct uh, perspective regarding the cochlear implant there are certain points for cochlear implantation point of view to be seen on mri see this is mri on screen yes to see the feasibility of cochlear implantation mri is very very important very important in the scene whether mr as the cochlear implantation is indicated or not so what we believe there is a basic functioning unit which is required for the candidacy of ci for any patient and that basic minimum functioning unit is a fluid filled cochlea and an intact cochlear nerve fluid filled cochlea and intact cochlear now these are two important prerequisites which is to be seen on mri 
if something audiologically some patient is a candidate for cochlear implantation you have to verify with the mri whether he is a feasible candidate for cochlear implantation or not because for cochlear implantation you need to stimulate cochlea and for that cochlea must have fluid for the implant to go in the cavity it must contain fluid so see this is heavily t2 weighted imaging and what you see is all the three tons of the cochlea and what you see bright inside is the fluid so on heavily t2 weighted mri if you have a good good fluid signal in the cochlea that means a good candidate then dynamically you see look at the nerves see the seventh eighth nerve complex this is the cochlear nerve going to the cochlea this is the vestibular nerve going to the vestibule so here you can see dynamically how is your cochlear nerve see this very clear integrity of the cochlear nerve and the fluid filled cochlea these are two things which must be seen on mri before doing any implantation now the third thing regarding the cochlear nerve what i am doing is a reconstruction of this mri what i am trying to show you the cochlear nerve whether it is a thin cochlear nerve or adequate cochlear nerve so what i am going to show you this is see in the sagittal plane this is sagittal plane there are four nerves in the intraortic meatus see in the dynamic this is the only way to see this is your cochlea laterally this is the co cochlea laterally and from there the four nerves emerging see this this is intraortic meatus four nerves see this this is your facial nerve above cochlear nerve below and these two vestibular nerves behind this is the cross section of the mri on sagittal sections this is facial nerve cochlear nerve and the rest of the two vestibular nerve and what to see on mri whether the cochlear nerve is hypoplastic or thin how you can have a fairly good idea this is facial nerve this is cochlear nerve if this cochlear nerve is less than less in dimension than facial nerve it can be considered as a hypoplastic cochlear nerve normally cochlear nerve diameter is big, bigger than the diameter of the facial nerve on mri if this cochlear nerve diameter is less than the diameter of the facial nerve it can be considered as a hypoplastic facial nerve so these are the three things we must see in the mri before any co cochlear implantation besides any other bigger anomaly or tumor in the you know the brain which can affect your hearing consequences that is another thing like a acoustic neuroma or something and other tumor which can impact the hearing outcome besides that so mri is very important cochlear implant in cochlear implantation in uh, you know csom and other thing the ct scan is important so how to look at ct mri all these things are important now some examples i am giving you some examples which needs to be you know discuss one by one see one of the uh, this examples i always mention this particular example many a times post mastectomy you will see a lot of patients coming with a discharging cavity discharging cavity has many reasons we all know theoretically high facial raise inadequate meatoplasty and other things which you can see from outside but the, there are things to be seen inside the third dimension has to be seen and that is that what kind of a mastectomy done by the previous surgeon ct scan will tell you if you have done a canal down mastectomy see on this right side this was a discharging cavity the, the surgeon has done a canal down mastectomy persistent discharging cavity and the reason is very obvious incomplete excentration of so many cells these cells containing mucosa is persistently discharging secreting because of unaeration 
So once you are doing a canal down, and if it is a persistent discharging cavity, once you get a case of canal down done, you must look at this third dimension that how the cells have been exenterated. Many a time, the hypotympanic cells and the cells in the petrous apex are responsible and you need to thoroughly drill them away. See how many cells are left behind and a cavity is created. So this is, I would say, a classic example of the incomplete job done and we must assess with a CT scan and then you can plan which cellularity is left behind, how much to exenterate, and how can you deal with this situation? You can deal with that or not. This is very, very important information where we get from the this thing, CT scan. Now, another information. This is very important. Uh, you know, and these days as we get a lot of, you know, revision cases after CI surgery, explantation. Examples of explantation after CI surgery. See this. And the thing which we always miss is the hidden disease. Like I tell you, children are the most important candidates for the cochlear implantation. What happens if there is an implant in place and the child develops otitis media, CSOM or any other infection? A foreign body is in the place in the vicinity of the infection, you know, prevents infection to cure, number one. It makes the antibiotics ineffective. And once the foreign body is there, it can develop biofilms and then all your antibiotics and everything becomes ineffective. So, and ultimately in majority of those patients, explantation is the final choice. And that's a disaster. Disaster for the patient for unnecessary surgery done, and the cochlea, you know, ultimately you have to explain the cochlea may not be, you know, viable for the next implantation and the cost involved and all that. And you know how it is overlooked? Look at the CT scan. Look at this baby. She's one and a half year old. One and a half year old. Simple history of recurrent, you know, Two or three episodes of secretory otitis media, minimal secretory on otoscopy. Now, what happens? Secretory otitis media is mostly because of the nasal issues. Could be used taken tube, could be adenoid, could be sinusitis, whatever. If this part is overlooked and this child is implanted, what can happen? The infection can again take place and then the implant can get involved. Now, Look at the paranasal sinuses of this child. Small child. Look at all this. Massive sinusitis. Massive sinusitis. I will show you the coronal. See? The sphenoid and all not developed. Frontal not developed. Because she's a very, very young child. And look at the maxillary sinuses. Look at the ethmoids. Massive sinusitis. And if such children... If such children implanted and the infection then turns back, what is going to happen? That's a disaster. So, in all these children, when you assess for the cochlear implantation, we must assess for the nasal causes. We keep under loop, under high scrutiny for patients who are having or you can say who are high likelihood to develop otitis media, like patients with, you know, cleft palate, who have a malformed eustachian in tube muscles, patients with recurrent SOM, patients with massive sinusitis, which is hidden part. Normally for such children, we don't get CT scan for the sinuses. And one can easily overlook. And if that kind of a massive problem exists, we do in such patients, these are the ideal Ideal gold standard indications for the subtotal petrojectinal implantation. What do we do in that? This patient was implanted after sub, uh, in the same stage with subtotal petrojectinal. What do we do? And why do we do that for? Why this CT scan is, you know, uh, forcing us to do that? In subtotal petrojectinal, you exenterate all possible air cells from the temporal bone and block off, remove all the mucosa and skin from the temporal bone, external canal everywhere, 
and block off all outer connections from the temporal bone for the infection to come into. Since after cochlear implantation, your middle ear and mastoid and external auditory canal are not going to participate in the hearing. So you can ablate the middle ear, external ear, everything. Because you are implanted directly stimulating the inner ear hair cells. So in subtotal petrojectomy, all this skin mucosa, everything remove all cell exenterated. And both the outer connections means connection through the eustachian tube and is blocked and the cul-de-sac closure is done from outside and the entire cavity is obliterated with the fat. So your implant resides in a new cavity covered by the fat which is a sterile zone with all external connections blocked off to prevent entry of infection to that region. Means by means of blocking the eustachian tube and the external artery canal. So these are the ideal candidates for subtotal petrojectomy implantation. And these are often overlooked. I am not saying these are not common, uh, uncommon. Uh, this is not uncommon. We have seen a couple of cases. And particularly nowadays with the, when the government schemes are prevalent, the free cochlear implant surgery being done, we have to be 100 times more choosy about it. We should not overlook. We must thoroughly assess on CT scan and clinical grounds, which are the patients who are high likelihood to develop, you know, infection later on. And in those patients, we can go ahead with the subtotal petrojectomy implantation in one go, preventing all possibility of future infection in the implant zone to, you know, direct us explantation. This is so important and information uh, from our perspective. Cochlear malformation, we have to be careful and accordingly choose our technique. I am not going uh, in details of the cochlear malformations. Now we have how much time left? Uh, to throw some lights regarding tumor. 20 minutes, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. So I, I will just take you through some of the important situations of, you know, tumors of the temporal bone, whether the radiological imaging is as a, a significant role. Just a minute. One of the important tumor, are, I, I will take you through some important, you know, situations. One of the important tumors is the glomus tumors. Diagnosis of the glomus tumors is very obvious many a times on clinical grounds by means of seeing a vascular mass lesion in the temporal bone. See this. This patient So the diagnosis is rarely a challenge in glomus tumor. And see, there are two types of glomus paraganglioma. Glomus or paraganglioma, there are two types of region. Jugular paraganglioma, tympanic paraganglioma. We must differentiate in between these two. Jugular paraganglioma arise from the jugular bulb and ultimately grow into the jugular bulb lumen and block the jugular bulb. See, this is a classical example of jugular paraganglioma with a lot of Flow void. This is a contrast image. Lot of flow voids into it. These are all vessels. And see, this is your jugular. Uh, see this. This is your sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, sigmoid sinus, and ultimately, uh, this is the jugular bulb region which is involved by the tumor. MRI gives you adequate information about the diagnosis. See the jugular glomus, jugular enhancing tumor with lot of flow voids. Relationship with the carotid artery anteriorly planes to separate from the carotid artery, which cannot be seen on CT scan. MRI has various sequences that gives you adequate information whether the tumor is in contact with the carotid artery, tumor is involving the wall of the carotid artery, and how much the tumor is engulfed the carotid artery, which dictates you to do further studies on the carotid and the cross flow. This is very important, which you know, kind of information you get from the MRI. Second thing, the other sequence of the MRI we see show you is the T2 weighted imaging. T2 weighted imaging again shows you all the flow whites. Look at the flow whites here in the T2 weighted imaging. Look at the flow whites. Look at these flow whites in the T2. This is classical, classical of the you know jugular paraganglioma. This is very, very important information we get 
from the you know in the glomus jugular tumor see this 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 is a big big vessels this flow voids are vessels this is large vessels in the tumor and now third information we must order third investigation is the ct angiogram ct angiogram will tell you each and every you know you know vessel going into this tumor see this is the tumor this is the tumor i am not going into details but if you see carefully in the neck this is common carotid dividing into external internal carotid and from there what vessels you can trace each and every single vessel going from there to the tumor see this is the, the this is the external carotid going behind and from here this is the external occipital artery which is given off and giving a big supply to this tumor so you can get to know amazing information about all the vessels going to the tumor if you if you have time and trace each and every individual vessel so that during surgery before handling the tumor you can block off all those vessels and devascularize to certain certain extent these tumors so this is very very uh, vital information i would say you can get uh, uh, from the mri and the ct angiogram another important is the simpler glomus tympanicum tumor glomus tympanicum tumors can be diagnosed as a mass behind the tympanic membrane but the best and the most relevant surgical information what you get is through the mri most relevant information kahan gaya kisko okay kidhar hai see this this is the mri of a patient of a glomus tympanicum now how to differentiate a tympanicum from the jugular see this mri this is where my cursor is this is sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus i am following the sigmoid sinus and this is jugular bulb this is jugular bulb and know where my tumor is my tumor is where see tumor is here tumor is here in the middle ear nothing to do with the glomus uh, jugular bulb this is the tumor which is prolapsing in the eustachian tube which is no attachment in the eustachian tube now what kind of information do you know want to know in these tumors whether they are extending to the mastoid so that you can plan a mastoidectomy approach whether they are going to the atic so you can accordingly plan an atic approach so what you can do you can reconstruct and see each and everything where this tumor is going see this see my reconstruction now see this is the tumor this is in the sagittal plane this is the tumor going into the atic see this is the atic region this is the tumor which is not going in the hypotympanum see now this is jugular bulb in the coronal plane this is jugular vein this is jugular bulb jugular bulb jugular bulb jugular bulb jugular bulb see sigmoid sinus but the tumor is above the jugular bulb this is hypotympanum this is mesotympanum this is epitympanum so in glomus tympanicum tumor you can get to know all the information where the extension of the tumor is what kind of the vascularity is supplying the tumor other examples quickly because the time is you know the constant acoustic neuromas one of the most uh, i would say common tumors in our practice acoustic neuromas are common tumors in our practice and we must know okay which is that this one yes so these are common tumors in our practice and we must know what kind of you know tumor whether it is a caustic or not see this is mri this is t2 weighted mri this is very important in diagnosing a caustic neuroma you need lots of you know uh, you know sequence of mri ct scan cannot diagnose acoustic neuromas see on mri this is your t2 weighted heavily t2 weighted imaging this is your contrast classically acoustic neuromas are hypo dense on t2 but hyper intense on contrast this separates 
or differentially diagnose the acoustic neuromas from other tumors like cholesteatomas, glomas, and other. See, this is classically hypotension T2 extending from the CP angle into the intraauditory meatus. See, always they extend into intraauditory meatus, enhances on contrast, and you know, heterogeneous texture. Heterogeneous texture means there are internal necrotic areas. That is classical for acoustic neuroma. So, acoustic neuroma require a lot of information for MRI in surgical planning. For example, see this simple information. This is the tumor, and this is the lateral part of the intraauditory canal which is not infiltrated. Such a vital information. This is CSF. CSF lateral to the tumor. These are inner ear, the cochlea and vestibule. Then, in the lateral most part of the canal is the fluid that is CSF. And tumor is medial. So these, this is the classic case where the tumor has not infiltrated the inner ear. If it has infiltrated the inner ear, you need a more extensive approach, you know, involving ablation of the inner ear, inner ear of the middle ear. Otherwise, most of the time they can be managed with a translabyrinthine approach. Translabyrinthine can remove any size tumor, size doesn't matter. See our access to the in the translabyrinthine is direct, direct from lateral head-on approach. And the first thing what we see is the intraauditory meatus and the facial nerve. So out of all the approaches, the translabyrinthine gives you the best opportunity to identify and uh, positively at the beginning of the surgery when you open the intraauditory meatus to identify the facial nerve and preserve it later on. Then there are, you know, variety of difficult situations in acoustic neuromas. You can come across acoustic neuromas sometimes are cystic. They pose a lot of problem as the peripheral cysts are difficult to remove in those situations. See, this is a caustic neuroma, which is purely cystic. Purely cystic, and this is very important. See this. This tumor. Yeah. See this. This is the tumor, and see there are inside the tumor multiple cysts. Multiple cysts in the tumor. This is a caustic neuroma and there are multiple cysts in the tumor. And this is, once they come to the periphery, it is differentiated, so difficult to separate the cyst wall from the uh, neurovascular structures in periphery and ultimately you have to leave it to protect the structure. So what kind of a caustic it is, you can differentiate from MRI. MRI gives you complete information about that kind of tumor it is, whether it is completely removable, what approach is required, how are the, you know, uh, the brain it is pressing on the ventricles, giving hydrocephalus, so many other things. All this information you can get from the uh, imaging. Imaging is so vital in those situations. So imaging, few more examples before we, you know, finish in our time. Uh, you know, this is so important. Uh, I can give you some more examples of the temporal bone malignancies, how to take decision making in a, uh, you know, malignancy temporal bone. This is very, very important in, uh, in uh, you know, certain situations. Satish, show some uh, trauma patients. Trauma? Trauma to the temporal bone. Trauma, I have to find out. Because, because they may be in some other folder. It may take time. But you are, uh, I forgot to include the trauma. I should have uh, included your right. But yes, in trauma, you can see the facial now. You know, I, I understand why you are asking. Uh, which, from which point of view. Sir, in the trauma, so, lot of trauma patients in the emergency as well as in the OPD and uh, how to manage them and what checklist we, we should see in the trauma uh, temporal bones radiology. Yes, yes. Your, 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 uh, your point is valid. We must see, uh, you know, uh, CT scan thoroughly in trauma patients when they present with facial palsy. This is very, very important, uh, you know, to see the trauma patients. Uh, let me show you if I get some.
temporal bone malignancies see this is a classic example recently we diagnosed in a doctor uh, himself the patient was a sir i have a temporal bone trauma uh, pt i'll just share it after 5 10 minutes after i download it sir i can share a temporal bone trauma ct in 5 minutes after i download it then we can get that one yeah 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 we can discuss yeah sure that's a great idea because uh, mine can take time to find out the trauma cts this was a uh, this patient was a doctor she had a mass in the mastoid can you see this this was a mass in the mastoid now whether it is malignant or not was a big question he presented with a facial nerve weakness because the mass was lying in the region of the facial nerve but still not sure whether it is you know uh, malignant or not so we got a diffusion weighted imaging and diffusion weighted imaging completely cleared up whether it was uh, uh, you can in those situation you can confidently say with a diffusion restriction if i get the image of the diffusion diffusion weighted imaging i always emphasize on that is a very very important imaging by means of which you can almost always with certainty rule out a malignant lesion because this lesion if it is showing restriction on diffusion is more likely to be malignant this is so important uh, that was a different sequence not this one so on ca temporal bone you need a lot of information from a, you know mri or ct scan from imaging you need kaun sa ye wala yes this another patient see in ca temporal bone surgery we all know is a big challenge it is not commonly practiced for the region of the anatomy i give you an example of this patient particular patient see this part resectability in temporal bone malignancy is a big question and the mri is the key to see the resectability the region being the close proximity to the important structures now see number 1 behind this is your transverse sinus this is sigmoid sinus and this is jugular bulb all intact the tumor is here the tumor is here away from the entire jugular venous system number 1 number 2 the carotid artery is here carotid artery is there it is away from the tumor mass whether it is involving middle ear inner ear third is the facial now which is immaterial in the malignancy but is involved you have to Resect and anastomose. That's a different issue. Here in the malignancy of the temporal bone, if you don't get the proximal end, the end of the brain side, you have to, you know, anastomose with the other nerve, like we do commonly with the mesenteric now. So here, resectability of the temporal bone malignancy is best seen on MRI, where the involvement of the carotid artery, involvement of the jugular venous system, involvement of the involvement of the brain. facial now everything you can get to know perfectly so that you can still resect such lesions and we have a now huge series wherein we have done uh, you know lots of temporal bone malignancies on the basis of mri mri is the fine thing which is most important which is decision making in those patients yes hello hello the you are audible you are audible sir yeah yeah i thought there was some question no no sir now see this is another example of an interesting patient some time see this child look at the age about 2 year old 2 year old child with such a massive tumor your mri will tell you resectability see this is like a cricket ball in the head such a massive tumor of the ipsilateral temporal bone 
entire temporal bone is replaced by the tumor. See, this is the normal temporal bone on the opposite side. This is the temporal bone on this side. Entire temporal bone is replaced. But you know the planes with the brain intact. See the plane. Planes with the brain intact. Planes with the carotid artery intact. Planes with the carotid artery absolutely intact. Planes with the sigmoids venous system absolutely intact. In spite of having been a huge tumor, this is chondrosarcoma, malignant tumor, two-year-old child, yet resectable and we resected and patient is doing fine. So your MRI can give you the exact information of the resectability. It's not the size of the tumor which matters. It is the involvement of the critical structures which matters in uh, when you talk of resectability. So there are so many things learned. Lot to go, but I know it is eight o'clock, so I have to be, you know, respecting the time. If you want me to continue, I can show a couple of examples, or we continue with the question answer. Dr. Satish, uh, yes, can you can you uh, tell our audience the checklist of HRCT temporal bones? What we should one, two, three, four. What we should uh, take care of this thing? Yeah, so it depends. Boss, I mentioned here your point is valid. It depends upon the pathology for which you are looking at the CT scan. Like, when you think of autosclerosis, when you are operating on autosclerosis, you, you need to look at different, different things. When you are operating for the CSOM, you need to look at different, different things. When you are operating for cochlear implantation, you need to look at different things. When you are operating for a tumor, operating for a cholesteatoma. So your concerns are different for different. So for autosclerosis, for example, you are least bothered about the pneumatization of the temporal bone, we are least bothered about aeration and other issues. We are more concerned about the facial now. We are more concerned about the inner ear if giving gusher or something. So the things are different according to the different pathologies, boss. So we, we we understood, uh, Dr. Satish, that the checklist is different for different conditions. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. Uh, here I would like to uh, thank you, Dr. Satish, so especially last week only for the information of all those who are listening. I was stuck in a cochlear implant on a small child, and this was due to non-visibility of the round window niche due to extensive thick bone and overgrowth of the bone around the round window niche. Dr. Satish has already shown you one uh, CT in which uh, he has pointed out that round window niche may be obscured only because of the uh, high thickness of the bone around the niche, especially the anterior lip area. So the, I want to thank you, Dr. Satish, for the timely uh, consultation and help in that particular child. It's a pleasure for me, but that was a real interesting situation, sir, with a lot of people overlook. And in your situation, it was yeah. not the pure visibility of the round window which was the concern. In your situation, the round window niche was very thick. Yes. Yeah. It was obscuring the round window. It was not the round window rotation which was creating problem. The niche was too thick. It could be appreciated very well on CT scan. And once you see on CT scan, the thick round window niche, you can, uh, you know, freely drill it off to expose the round window. That was a very interesting situation, sir. So why why I raised this issue is only to convey that uh, you can be stuck at any point of time, at any stage. And what is the importance of knowing the anatomy and the findings in a in particular situation on a complex temporal bone? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Dr. Stish, I have a small uh, question for you. Please, please, please. Uh, everybody wants to know about the software. Yes. So, on the DICOM. Yes, sir. How much does it cost and how to procure it? Yeah, you can buy online. There is a trial version for some time. Then it, they, they charge a subscription of five years or something for, say, 15,000. I don't remember exactly now. Uh, 15 17,000 for five years. Okay, it's not, not that expensive. Yeah. But this, 
uh, you know, this platform gives you ability to see all sorts of scan on the planet. CT, yeah. MRI, you know, uh, cone beam scan, PET scan, all scans okay. can be seen on this with all so many, there are, there are so many things to be seen, various windows, settings, you know, you can measure the submillimetric structures, you can convert to 3D, you can convert to bone, so many things you can see. See this, I can convert to bone, whether how it is, you know, you can look at the, all the aspects. So this is, this is a very, very important, you know, tool to give us ability to see the surgical details in all three dimensions which radiologists don't give. The only issue is we need to learn ourselves. If you want to know which vessel is entering the tumor, you would like to know how it is entering into the tumor. Like in acoustic neuroma, we see how the facial nerve is related to how it is entering post anteriorly enterosubinally. Those vital information cannot be gained from the radiologist's report. They never mention all that in detail. They are too busy to do other things. So they are more or less, you know, uh, sort of technicians in terms of giving a limited information. For surgical details, either you have to have a good lysing with the radiologist to be, you know, uh, to stay in one-to-one -one contact to get each and every information in detail for every patient. If you have that kind of a rapport mm -hmm. lysing with the radiologist. Otherwise, you have to learn yourself and this makes a difference in your practice because many a times, otherwise, you come across surprises. By means of radiology, 99% of the time, you are quite confident in tumors, particularly what exactly the tumor is, so you can plan accordingly, counsel your patient accordingly, plan your approach accordingly, you know, avoid the complications accordingly, and convince of the possible complication to the patient. Otherwise, you you think something, it turns out to be something else, and then everything becomes a mess. So it's very important. True. Dr. Satish, I have got a question. Yes, please. Uh, this is for the benefit of uh, residents. That, yes, uh, uh, like, should we forget about X-ray mastoids presently? The X-ray mastoids do not give... Because why I'm asking this question is, this question yeah. is for postgraduates. And we do ask them as examiners. I've been examiner for donkey's years now. We do ask. The things have changed. I know. There are things like in our college also now CT scan and everything is available. But uh, there are certain situations in which CT scan might not be available. I'm talking of CSOM cases. I'm not talking of special cases like acoustic neuroma and all. That is all altogether different situation. CSOM, squamosal type of disease. Is there any role still left for X-ray x ray, x -ray Hardly any. The X-ray mastoid can give you limited information of pneumatization. Yeah. That's the only thing. Like the rest of the things, the way we look at the CT scan, regarding the entire course of the patient now at every level, you know, relationship with the brain, relationship with the tagman, inner ear, now cannot be differentiated on X-ray. X-ray gives the limited snapshot information regarding the overall pneumatization, nothing more than that. So, in cases of CSM, squamosal type and all, yeah. we should go in only for Most HRCT temporal time, bone in uncomplicated cases, I'm yeah. talking in about. In uncomplicated CSM, particularly in perforations, squamosal type, even the CT scan is not going to be very useful in terms of giving additional information, in terms of giving decision-making information. It is more useful in cholestatoma and other situation where you need to see the third dimension, which is likely to be affected. In cholestatoma, how it is extending, you have to plan an intact canal, canal down, you have to look at facial now, you have to look at labyrinthine fistula, you have to look at tagmen or sinus erosion. Those vital information is given by CT scan and that's why it is more useful. Then in squamosal otitis media where all this information is of no relevance. No, so it is more important in unsafe cholesterol disease than in a safe disease. So, 
So in other words, like uh, radiology has got no role in commercial uncomplicated. Hardly you any... have to open up and see. Yes. You have to open up and see yourself. Yes. Yes. So please, residents, note down this answer. This is coming from Dr. Satish Jain. You can quote him in the exams also. Can I, Dr. Satish Jain, can I take this liberty please, please, of getting please, you please. quoted during the exams also? Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, sir, so Ashraman Man is ready with the HRCT of temporal bone <laughs> of the trauma case. So Hello. I request Satish and sir to please uh, uh, answer your screen so that ma'am can share the screen now. Yeah, yeah, please share on the screen. Sir, you'll have to uh, stop sharing, sir. You'll have to stop okay, sharing okay, and okay. then it will start. Sharing. Yes, now I can see. Yeah, I can see. See, in trauma, in trauma, you need to look at few aspects. Most of the time, it is related to the facial nerve. So, there are fractures. You have to define how the fracture line is going. According to the, you know, velocity and the direction of the injury, the fracture line is defined. Uh, yeah, see, if the fracture line is parallel to the long axis of the petrous bone, See this along the along the long axis of the petrous bone is longitudinal fractures, and most of the time your facial nerve is spared. If the fracture line is across or perpendicular to the petrous bone, then it is likely to involve the facial nerve very often in immediate palsy. In indirect oblique or longitudinal fractures. Most of the time, facial nerve is spared. If at all injured, it is at the level of the first JNU where the facial canal is affected. Now, for the decision making, for the decision making whether the facial nerve decompression or facial nerve treatment is required, it is the clinical course need to be taken into consideration. By and large, any facial palsy which is developed immediately after the trauma is likely to have involved the facial now and which requires some sort of, you know, treatment immediately. And those facial nerve palsies which developed later on after the trauma in longitudinal and other fractures because of the edema in the facial canal or some hematoma developed and all those are predominantly conservatively managed. Now on CT scan, but help further here in those situations if some bone piece or bone fragment is involving compressing facial now if some hematoma is developed which has swollen up the facial now all those things you can see on the ct scan and in those situations even if not having a transverse fracture in those situations is still there you can find the indication for decompression or you know uh, you know surgical treatment so the CT scan is very important to define the kind of fracture, the involvement of the facial now. I've shown you in the previous CT scan how to look at the facial now, right from the first genu to the uh, to the stylomaster foramen. So the kind of fracture line the particular patient has has an impact on the development of facial palsy and the need of decompression or any other for the treatment. Sir, here I would like to add that yeah. there is... See a, this fracture no, line sir. across the labyrinth. Can you see yeah. this patient? See this fracture line across the petrous bone. Yeah, stop here, stop here. Go back, go back. See this transfer fracture. Can you everybody see? Yes. On the right side. This fracture line across. And if you go down, now you go down, you will see where the fracture line is passing through at the level of the facial now. Down, down, down. Now see the fracture line passing through the horizontal or the second genu. See where your cursor is. See this? If such patient presents with a complete facial pansy at the time of onset, is the patient for Immediate exploration. Many a times you will find the fractures in the facial canal, yet facial now being intact. 
with some hematoma or fracture segment compressing on it and these are the cases even if you have in the most massive injuries transjections you can this is repairable because this is in the middle ear epitympanum so the ct scan is decisive in these situations what to do when to intervene and what kind of intervention is required so there are two points from my side in <coughs> facial nerve paralysis sir <coughs> Because, as you know, I had been dealing with military accidents and yes, aviation injury, injuries and all. Yes. First point, <clears throat> as you very rightly said, immediate onset, complete paralysis. So the uh, victim is IOCP. If you remember, this is for postgraduates. Immediate onset, complete paralysis, immediate exploration. Am I wrong, sir? Right. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now, the thing is that most of the time, head injury patient, road traffic accidents, aviation injuries, these come to us as a referral cases. The history is very important in these cases. And as soon as you elicit the history and the head injury part, the patient is absolutely fine. You please explore the patient. Second thing is, like you have rightly said, longitudinal versus transverse paralysis. It is very well mentioned in Scott Brown's earlier. When I was a student, MS student, we I think we had fourth edition of Scott Brown. Very nicely mentioned longitudinal fracture versus uh, transfer fractures. Transfer fractures, cochlear injury, facial nerve injury, longitudinal uh, this thing, conductive hearing loss in other cases. It was sensitive hearing loss with facial nerve paralysis. This is I'm talking of for the benefit of postgraduates. Thank you. So do we have some time for some yes, questions? Sir. There were some people who had asked some questions. Yes, please. Now we can take one or two questions. <clears throat> Hello. We we Hello. have two questions, sir. Doctor Raman. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Uh, Hello. Hello, sir. Good evening. We welcome you, sir. Good evening, uh, Dr. Raman and everyone. I must congratulate the association as well as you young guys. Uh, Dr. Satish and his master class. And one take home message is that you must have a good trust with the, your uh, radiologist because they are not busy, but they don't know what you need. So everyone should have a very good trust within your or uh, X-ray person, your radiologist. So both of you learn on the way. So wonderful conversations again to whole team. Dr. Thank Sati, you. How are you? Fine, sir. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Go ahead. Go Dr. Ahead. Satish, I have got a personal question with you. Please. Sir, can I do my MS again under you, sir? Oh, yes, sir, sir. Pleasure <laughs> working with you. And uh, for such comment. I I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a 65 years old uh, oh, person. Oh I don't know how I can get into another MS. MS2, I can call it as. Because uh, that will be more beneficial for my second uh, you know incarnation probably i will be born as ent specialist i do pray to god that i will be born as a uh, second ent specialist in second janam jo bolte hai usko thank you very much why why do you worry about the degree you, you yeah. want to enhance enhance your knowledge no no i enhance want to enhance my knowledge degree is immaterial at my stage yeah I've got a lot of degrees and a lot of medals and all, everything. <laughs> so I think uh, that is immaterial for me. But uh, the way Dr. Satish Jain has uh, presented and uh, the surgeon he is, so I think everybody should be like that. Thank you. Thank you so on behalf of uh, Haryana State EO, I extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Satish Jain for spending the valuable time and sharing such an informative lecture with all of us. And I'm sure that everybody who served as joined is immensely benefited by this talk. Thank you so much once again. Thank you all. Thank you all once again for giving me this opportunity.
thank you once again so uh, thank you very much sir for uh, uh, dr ashma our second moderator ma'am you want to say something dr we were just asking if there were two three questions for you so if you had time you could just yeah, finish please, them please please the one question was by dr mandata that what do you do in a case of persistent stapedial artery do you have to abandon the surgery all the time or can you do something yeah so that's a very interesting situation i have come across such situation four times in life you know the first time when i came across i didn't have a ct scan that time done before and when i saw the persistent stapedial artery and it was in my field and ultimately in order to do the surgery anyhow i coagulated and went ahead and did the surgery and fortunately nothing happened then i went to literature to know what exactly i did could it have any repercussions any complications or anything this artery is destined to supply some intracranial structures if it is persistent normally it is absorbed by the 10th week of gestation and this function is taken over by the middle meningeal artery if it is persistent it is destined to supply some areas if it is important area it can lead to infarction or complication or something and it has been reported so after that our approach is changed and nowadays in two patients we could put the piston besides the artery without coagulating the artery or without removing the artery or anything thing little gentle preserve the artery and did the stapedial surgery in one patient abandoned having the huge vessel huge means the entire obturator foramen between the you know both the crura was obliterated by the artery so nowadays we are abstaining from coagulating the artery with the fear that it might be supplying some area and which should be respected thank you sir so the next question is radiologically what is a high riding jugular bulb high riding jugular bulb definition yes sir radiologically you know, yeah so radiologically you can see in coronal section that how much high the jugular bulb is going if it is going coming to the level of the round window it is considered high jugular bulb it is going if it is going further above further above the level of the round window reaching to the level of the internal costing meters then it is considered very high rising and this is very important not only in the medullary surgery but in lateral stall based surgeries initially it was considered to be a contraindication but now it is believe me it is no more a contraindication you can reduce your jugular bulb down as i said earlier by means of removing whatever thin bone over it more high it is more thin the bone or boneless it is going to be not covered by the bone only periosteum and in that situation you can by means of using your periosteum elevator you can push it down then taking the help of you know the surgery cell and the bone wax and then above that the periosteum elevator you can keep pushing and with the bone wax you can fix it down so it is no longer a contraindication in those situations provided you have a good exposure like subtotal petrojectomy or something to deal with the bleeding in case happens to occur but radiologically you can pick up very well on coronal section a jugular bulb that how much high it is going and accordingly you have to plan your surgical approach and counseling So one last question is there for you. Is there any advantage of endoscopic stapedotomy in case of persistent stapedial artery? See, endoscopic uh, stapedotomy is a new approach. As you know, wherever the endoscope is being used, more and more you know, uh, you know, options are being explored. So, advantage of endoscopic stapedotomy. is to give you exposure by means of without too much of drilling or removal of the overhang that's the biggest advantage to get with the endoscope because in microscope you cannot get a linear view unless you remove the overhang in endoscope with a wide angle endoscope you practically don't need to remove too much of overhang and you can go ahead doing stapedotomy without doing that now but that is a two dimensional visualization not a 3d like microscope 
Now coming to the stapedial artery, stapedial artery, artery is an anomaly coming in the way to the foot plate. Here endoscope or microscope is uh, nothing is going to matter. So in cases of a, a persistent stapedial artery, endoscope has no practical, you know, special um, relevance. Endoscope, microscope, same, it is the artery which matters. Thank you very much, sir. You're a true teacher that you're taking questions long after the formal talk has ended and you're always enthusiastically answering all kinds of queries. It was so lovely to hear you. It always is before the start of any surgery, we actually wait for the time when the case is getting induced and you tell about the radiology. And no matter how many times we hear your like or see you on the YouTube links. It's always something more done for you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your attention, your involvement. And um, uh, it's really, really a pleasure association. Always, um, you know, associating with the Haryana people, Haryana AOI, Haryana workshops, conferences. It's, it's, it's like, you know, uh, our own team we are working with. Thank you so much once again, everybody. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So uh, thank you very much for enlightening us with the ocean of knowledge you have uh, on the radiology of temporal bone. And uh, sir, every time we, we have many videos on uh, YouTube, but every time, uh, as Dr. Ashima said, every time we listen to you, we uh, get something new out of it. So thank you very much, sir, for taking out your time. So. Uh, we are going to have our next uh, radiology session on 19th, the last radiology session on head and neck by Dr. Jyoti Kumar. So today I want to conclude. Before uh, concluding, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Rupendra Ranga, sir, uh, as representative of Haryana AOI to say a few words and then we can call, call, uh, call it a day. I think it was a well conducted and well attended and, on the temporal bone uh, anatomy and radiology and I am very thankful to Dr. Satish Jain for teaching this uh, radiology in a very simple manner. Dr. Satish always very keen to teach ENT, radiology and surgical procedure in a very simple manner. Even though Dr. Satish busy uh, on the 12th and he asked me to prepon by 11th. That's the reason we have planned for this today. Yes. Dr. Satish and don't deny, we will not do. They asked me. Right, sir. Pre-pon. I'm thankful, Dr. Satish. And All I thanks to you, boss. All thanks to you for your kind consideration. And, uh, Dr. Ashima for this, uh, uh, moderating this session. And I am thankful to Dr. Raman Sharma, J.C. Pasi, the brain behind this show. I'm thankful to all the uh, person, all the doctors who log in this Zoom meeting today. Good night, everyone. So today we have crossed the century. We have made a century. More than 100 past participants were there. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you sir. Congratulations. So thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good thank night. You. Good night, sir. Thank you.